What do you remember from last year? Try to recall the details. How much of it is crystal clear, and how much has faded into the background? Most of us tend to think of memory as a personal archive, ever expanding and readily accessible. But is that really how it works? To answer this question, we need to understand the workings of the human mind. Today, we'll explore the functions of memory. Why forgetting is actually an important part of how our brains operate, and how memory and the forgetting influence leaders' decision making. What is memory? Memory allows us to navigate our daily lives with a sense of continuity and understanding. It influences our behaviors, our relationships, and even our identity. By connecting our past with our present, memory helps us make sense of the world around us, predict potential future outcomes, and maintain a narrative of our own life. Through memory, we not only recall the events that have shaped us, but also learn from them. In essence, memory serves as a bridge between our experiences, our action, and what we do next. When we lose memory, it's as if pieces of the puzzle of our lives start to disappear. Imagine walking into a room and feeling a sense of familiarity, but not knowing why, or looking at a loved one. And sensing a connection, but not recalling past moments shared together, memory loss can disrupt our sense of continuity, making the world seem disjointed and often confusing. For those experiencing significant memory loss, such as in cases of Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia, the effects are profound. Daily tasks become challenges as the memory cues that guide behavior are weakened or lost. Personal histories blur, affecting one's identity and the ability to relate to others. This can lead to feelings of isolation and distress, both for the individual and for the loved ones. And its core memory is the mental process of encoding, storing, and retrieving information. This complex process is important for learning, adapting to new situations, and making informed decisions based on past experiences. Imagine trying to learn a new language without the ability to remember words you studied just yesterday, or making a decision without any recall of relevant past experiences. It's difficult, right? That's because memory is foundational into our learning process. It allows us. To store and retrieve the knowledge that informs our actions and decisions every day. To better understand how this works, let's look at different types of memory. First, we have sensory memory, which is the shortest term element of memory. It acts as a buffer for stimuli received through our sensory systems, and it holds these memories just long enough for them to be processed into short-term memory. If attention is directed to them, a good example of this is iconic memory, a type of visual sensory memory. Imagine catching a brief glimpse of someone's face as we pass by them on the street. Iconic memory allows us to momentarily recall specific details, like the color of their eyes or the expression they wore, even though the image lasts for less than a second before fading. Unless we focus on it and move the information to short-term memory, then there is short-term memory, sometimes called working memory. This is where small amounts of information are actively held in mind for a short period of time. It's what we use to keep a phone number in mind just long enough to dial it. We also have long-term memory, which is our brain's system for storing, managing. And retrieving information for longer periods of time. Long-term memory includes everything from remembering the names of your childhood friends to recalling critical life events years after they've happened. All those types of memory work together to form our identities and influence how we perceive the world around us. They allow us to build a continuous sense of self. From childhood to adulthood, shaping our reactions and interactions every day. 
how are memories stored and managed in our brain? This brings us to three fundamental processes, encoding, storage, and retrieval. Encoding is the first step in the memory process. It's the phase where our brain transforms what we perceive into the form that it can be stored and retrieved later. Think of it as the brain's way of translating raw data into a structured and usable format. Our brain converts external stimuli, such as visual images, sounds, tactile sensations, or abstract thoughts into a format that the brain's neural circuits can process and retrieve. This conversion is facilitated by multiple brain regions, such as the sensory cortices for initial processing and the hippocampus, which play a critical role in organizing these inputs into a coherent structure suitable for long-term storage. For example, when encoding the site of a meal, the visual cortex processes the colors and the shapes, while other parts of the brain may link those images with related emotions or memories, thereby creating a multidimensional memory trace. This is also why taking handwritten notes is more effective than digital notes. Writing by hand requires processing information in a more detailed way, which leads to better encoding of the information into memory. This process involves deeper cognitive processing of the material, and you need to summarize, paraphrase, and understand the content to write it down effectively. Handwriting activates motor pathways in the brain, creating a stronger neural trace in memory. The physical act of writing engages in motor skills that can help forge a more robust connection in the brain than typing. The physical act of writing engages in motor skills that can help forge a more robust connection in the brain than typing, making the information more memorable. Writing notes by hand helps in maintaining focus and attention. The slower process of writing compared to typing ensures that you are actively engaged with the materials, which reduces cognitive distractions and allows for deeper mental processing. Once encoded, this information moves to the next phase, storage. Unlike a camera that captures and stores images as static files, the brain engages in a much more dynamic process. When information is stored in the brain, it's not just filed away. Instead, brain regions like the hippocampus and the cerebral cortex work together to organize and constantly reorganize those memories. The hippocampus is especially important for determining how memories are initially formed and where they are stored. It acts like a sort of memory distributor, tagging each memory based on its importance and deciding if it should be kept in short-term storage for immediate recall or transferred to long-term storage for more permanent retention. As for the cerebral cortex, it serves as the main hub for long-term memory storage, handling complex processes that solidify memories over time. This reorganization is influenced by how often we recall a memory and its emotional salience, which can change the strength and the detail of the memory. So the final resting place of memories, be they in short-term or long-term storage, really depends on how the brain evaluates their importance and utility. This dynamic memory storage process ensures that our most valuable memories are preserved and readily accessible, while less significant details are gradually faded out. The process that our brain consolidates memories for long-term memory is called memory consolidation. It involves several brain regions, primarily the hippocampus and the cerebral cortex. During memory consolidation, the hippocampus replays the day's experiences essentially practicing the memory. When does this critical memory consolidation take place? The answer lies in something we all cherish, sleep. During sleep, especially during the deep stages of non-REM sleep, our brains are incredibly active, 
It's during these quiet hours that the hippocampus and the cerebral cortex engage in a significant transfer of information. This transfer is like moving files from a USB drive to a more secure long-term storage on your computer's hard drive. The memories stored in the hippocampus are transferred to the cerebral cortex, where they are integrated into a broader network of knowledge and experience. Recent research suggests that the hippocampus not only assists memory, but also generates deep sleep brain waves, which are connected to memory consolidation during sleep. Sleep not only helps in consolidating memories, but also in enhancing the quality of those memories. The connections between neurons are strengthened, making the memories less susceptible to interference. As we wake up, the consolidation process helps us retain and recall those memories more effectively. So the saying, sleep on it, holds more truth than we might realize, playing a key role in how we remember and learn. The final step of memory process is retrieval. We need to access and pull out the stored memories. It's like searching through a file cabinet, except the files are in your brain and you are retrieving them for use in your daily life. Now let's talk about malleability of memory. It's a fascinating and sometimes unsettling feature of memory. Memories are not static. They can change over time. Each time you recall a memory, it's susceptible to change. It's similar to retelling a story. The core elements may stay the same, but details can change with every recounting. This malleability means that our memories can be influenced by many factors, including our current emotions, new information, how we recount them to others. Our motives play a significant role in this process as well. When we try to recall a memory, our current goals and the desires can influence which memory come to mind and how they are reconstructed. For example, if we are motivated to see ourselves in a positive light, we may recall past events in a way that emphasizes our strength and downplay our mistakes. This selective memory retrieval can be beneficial because it helps the integration of new learning and the adaption of past experiences to new situations. However, it also carries the risk of creating inaccuracies or distortions in our memories because it changes our perception of past events based on our current motives and needs. Our memory is selective, self-serving, adaptive, and susceptible to error. Those are features of memories, how it is stored, how it is retrieved, and how it changes, it show us that memory is a living, breathing process influenced by many factors. As we navigate through life, our brain continuously updates and revises our memories. But if a memory is so adaptable and important, why do we forget? Herman Epenhaus a pioneer in memory research, gave us the first clue with his famous forgetting curve. This graph shows how information is lost over time when there is no effort to retrieve it. Evanhaus found that much of what we learn starts to fade quickly. His study suggests that memory goes down to 40% within the first few days and that the forgetting curve is exponential. This is not a flaw of our brain, rather it is a clever adaptive feature that clears out less useful information, making way for new, potentially more relevant data. Imagine our brain as a constantly updating database. It needs to clear out less useful information to make space for new, potentially more relevant data. This selective forgetting allows us to prioritize and retain what matters most. But there is more to this story. Our brain, which makes up only about 2% of our body weight, uses approximately 20% of our energy. Maintaining such a high level of energy consumption is demanding. To manage this, 
the brain must be incredibly energy efficient. When letting go of the memories it deems less necessary, it conserves energy, focusing resources on strengthening more important, frequently retrieved memories. This process is important not just for keeping our brain's energy demands in check, but also making us more adaptive and responsive to new experiences. By sharing the cognitive load of less useful information, our brain remains agile and efficient, ready to absorb and use new knowledge. So next time you forget something, remember, it may just be your brain making room for something even more important. Another reason we forget is due to what's now as interference theory. Imagine our memories are like radio stations. Sometimes when we try to tune in into a station, another nearby frequency interferes, creating static and making it hard to hear clearly. Similarly, in our brains, some memories can interfere with each other. This happens in two main ways, proactive interference and retroactive interference. Proactive interference occurs when older memories inhibit the ability to remember new information. Imagine trying to learn a new phone number, but an old number keeps popping up in your mind. That's proactive interference at work. On the flip side, retroactive interference happens when new information causes us to forget older information. For example, after remembering a new password, you may struggle to remember your old one. This interference among memories means that our brain's ability to store and retrieve information can sometimes be as challenging as trying to catch a clear signal among competing radio frequencies. Our brain continuously works to manage those interferences through different cognitive processes, such as consolidating memories during sleep and prioritizing memories based on emotional salience and the frequency of recall. Effective memory management help minimize those interferences, allowing clearer and more accessible memories, much like tuning into a clear radio station without any static. To improve the clarity and accessibility of our memories, we can use strategies such as repeated practice, focused attention, organize the retrieval cues, and taking handwritten notes. Another reason for forgetting is motivated forgetting. Sometimes our minds choose to forget. This can be a defense mechanism against emotionally painful or threatening memories. It's our brain's way of protecting us allowing us to continue with our lives without being weighed down by past trauma. So forgetting is not a flaw in our memory system. It's an intricate part of how our brain manages information. It helps us prioritize, reduce cognitive load, and heal emotionally. How does memory and forgetting influence leaders' decision-making? The decisions that leaders make and the knowledge they draw upon are all deeply influenced by what they remember and what they choose to forget. Consider the idea of a strategic forgetting. Leaders often face information overload and must decide not just what to focus on, but also what to discard. Strategic forgetting optimizes mental resources and allows them to bypass less relevant or outdated information enabling them to focus on what matters most in achieving their goals. Let's look at some examples. Winston Churchill, known for his prodigious memory, used detailed recollections of historical events to inform his strategies during World War II. His ability to recall past military failures and successes shaped many of his decisions that led to the Allies' victory. On the other hand, Steve Jobs was known for his selective memory and creating his own reality distortion field. He would famously ignore past failures to push forward with his vision, a trait that sometimes led to repeating past mistakes and other times resulted in groundbreaking innovations. Selective memory and the strategic forgetting can be a double-edged sword for leaders' decision-making. 
on the one hand, those cognitive processes enable leaders to focus on relevant information, prioritize tasks, and make decisions without being overwhelmed by the vast amount of available information. Selective memory helps in filtering out irrelevant details and retaining what is important for strategic planning and execution. Strategic forgetting similarly allows leaders to remove past outdated or incorrect information that might otherwise clutter judgment and impede progress. However, the downside is that this same mechanisms can lead to biases and blind spots. Leaders may unconsciously ignore information that contradicts their beliefs and overlook important details that don't fit their own narratives. This can result in a skewed perception of reality, potentially leading to poor decision-making. For example, confirmation bias, which is a form of a selective memory, can cause leaders to remember only the information that just supports their perceived notions. While strategic forgetting may lead them to disregard valuable insights from past experiences or alternative viewpoints. Moreover, over-reliance on those cognitive strategies can create an echo chamber where only agreeable information is acknowledged and the dissenting voices are silenced. Observe how often leaders surround themselves with yes men. This can stifle innovation and critical thinking in an organization because leaders may become resistant to new ideas or feedback. The consequences of selective memory and the strategic forgetting can range from minor inefficiencies to significant strategic missteps with long-term implications. As we wrap up, think about the role of memory and the forgetting in your own life. How does what you remember or choose to forget influence your decisions? Thank you for joining us on this journey through the mind labyrinth of memory and forgetting. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, keep questioning and exploring.